As we turn to the Word of God, I want to just tell a quick story just to set up the Word, if that's okay. I promise I won't have you stand it too long, but there was a man living on a farm in the mountains with his young grandson. Each morning, he was up early sitting at the kitchen table reading from his worn out Bible. His grandson wanted to be just like his grandfather. And he tried to imitate him in every single way. One day, the grandson asked a question. He said, Granddaddy, I try to read the Bible just like you, but I don't quite understand it. And what I do understand, I forget as soon as I close the book. What good does reading the Bible do? The grandfather qu quietly turned from putting coal into the stove and said, Grandson, I want you to take this old wicker coal basket. Take it down to the river and bring back a basket of water. The boy did as his grandfather told him. He yet all the water leaked out of the basket before he could get back to the house. The grandfather laughed and said, you will have to move a little, a little faster next time. And he sent him out to do it again. This time the boy ran faster, but again the basket was empty before he returned home. Now out of breath, he told his grandfather, he said, Granddaddy, it's impossible to carry water in this basket. He said, I, I, I think I should try to get a bucket. Let, let me use a bucket instead. But granddaddy said, no, I don't want a bucket of water. I want a basket of water. He said, you can do this. You're just not trying hard enough. Then the old man went out the front door to watch his grandson try again. The boy was now thoroughly convinced that it was impossible. But he wanted to show his grandfather that even if he ran as fast as he could, the water would still leak out. So he went down to the river, scooped the water, scooped the water into the basket, and he ran as fast as he could. But when he reached his grandfather, the basket was yet empty again. Out of breath, he said, see, granddaddy, it's useless. Then the old man said, look at the basket. Look at the basket. The, the boy looked at the basket and for the first time he realized that the basket looked different. Instead of a dirty old wicker cold basket, it was now clean. Then the old man said to his grandson, he said, see, that's what happens when you read the Bible. You might not understand or remember everything, but when you read it, it will change you from the inside out. The old man looked at his grandson in the eyes and he said, take time to read a portion of God's word each day. It will change you even if you don't think you're retaining a single word. I need you to look at a neighbor and say, neighbor, it will change you from the inside out. Let's go to the Word. John chapter 15, verses 4 through 7. In John chapter 15, verse 4 through 7, Jesus uses a powerful metaphor of a vine and branches to explain our connection to God and the importance of staying connected to Him through faith and His Word. Connect for, connect for. That's the sermon series. The word of the Lord says in verse 4, Jesus says, Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Somebody say, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will, you will bear much fruit. Somebody say much fruit. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. 
If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. Verse 7. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. I want to hang my hat on this verse here. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. For a moment, I want to preach from the text, from the thought, the topic, the benefits of being connected through God's word. The benefits of being connected through God's word. As you take your seat, just tell that neighbor, say, neighbor, I have benefits. I have benefits. I have benefits. If you're glad that you have benefits, somebody put a praise on it right there. People of God, before we move any further, let's establish that Jesus is the Word. And the Word of God is Jesus. Let's establish that you cannot separate God from His Word and vice versa. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, it says, In the beginning was the Word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him, somebody say him, was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. I want you to understand that here, the word refers to Jesus, who existed eternally with God and through whom everything was created. Then here comes verse 14. I love verse 14. It says, the word became flesh. It became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. People of God, this verse explicitly states and shows us that the Word became flesh, referring to Jesus taking on a human body and dwelt among humanity. Therefore, it is impossible to connect to Jesus without connecting to his Word. I need you to tell a neighbor, say, neighbor, if you want to connect to Jesus, I must connect to his word. I must connect to his word. People of God, we live in a time where there's a growing trend of people in society that will question the authority and authenticity of the word of God. One group of critics will inaccurately claim that there's historical and scientific inaccuracies in the Bible questioning its factual basis. Then there's another group of critics that will falsely claim evidence of unreliable authorship by alleged inconsistencies or discrepancies within the text. Somebody say the devil is a liar. Then you have your social media group of critics that will view some of the biblical stories as mythology or folklore and not factual accounts of history that actually happened at some point in time. I can't tell you how many times it, it makes my blood boil to see non-believers tell believers on social media to, to just keep on believing in your book of fairy tales. I don't know if anybody else in here feel that way. It just makes my blood boil. 
But despite years of attacks by these groups and others, the Bible has withstood the test of time and has proven over and over and over again to be reliable, to be accurate and authentic in God's divine inspiration and authorship. Jesus said in Matthew 24 and 35, he says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Although all of these groups are inaccurate in their claims, I need you to understand that their positions pose a hindrance to connecting to God through his word. Here's seven other obstacles that we must avoid that can hinder us from connecting to God through his word. Seven obstacles we must avoid. The first obstacle we must avoid is lack of discipline. Somebody say lack of discipline. You have to realize, Victory, that developing a consistent habit of reading and studying the Bible requires dedication and discipline. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen by osmosis. It doesn't happen as soon as you're saved. You have to put some work into it. Lack of discipline makes it hard to carve out dedicated time for studying God's word. Skipping days can disrupt the flow of thought and make it harder to retain information or see the bigger picture even within the text. Somebody say lack of discipline. Uh, the second hindrance that we must avoid, number two, is distractions. Somebody say distractions. Our fast-paced world presents numerous distractions that compete for our attention when we attempt to focus on Scripture. Am I talking to anybody in here? Our constant connection to phones, to our iPhones and our laptops and social media can pull our attention away from the Bible and lead to shallow, not just shallow, but skimming reading instead of deep reflection. Trying to read the Bible while doing other activities like eating or watching TV and keeping up with uh, the housewives of Atlanta can make it difficult to concentrate on the message of God's word. Thoughts about work, finances, or personal problems can easily interrupt our focus on scripture. Somebody say distractions. Number three, spiritual immaturity. Spiritual immaturity. A new believer might struggle to understand complex passages or feel intimidated by the sheer volume of the Bible. After all, it is 66 books. But tell that neighbor you don't have to read it all in one day. Without a strong foundation in faith and proper study methods, a spiritually immature person might misinterpret Scripture. Someone who is spiritually immature might prioritize worldly concerns or entertainment over time spent studying God's word. A spiritually immature person might be more susceptible to false teachings or misleading interpretations of Holy Scripture. Somebody say spiritual immaturity. The fourth hindrance we must avoid it's discouragement. Discouragement. People of God, I need you to understand that encountering passages that you might not understand can lead to discouragement and a desire to give up. I don't know about you, but numbers does it for me. Anybody tried reading numbers and you're going through the repetitive, intricate, detailed process that Israel that the people of God was to go to, to go through to make this sacrifice and that sacrifice is like a thousand and one different types of sacrifices. And I don't know about you, but that would cause me to be dis discouraged sometimes. 
but you have to keep on reading. See, when discouraged, the effort required to read and study the Bible can feel overwhelming. The initial spark of inspiration to dive into scripture might fade away, leading to procrastination and avoidance. Anybody in here have ever said, you know, I, I'll get to it tomorrow? Yeah, I'm going to start my reading regiment next week. <laughs> Discouragement often leads to focusing on negative emotions in life circumstances. This can make it challenging to concentrate on the positive aspects of scripture, such as hope, such as promises, the promises of God, the benefits of, that we have in God, and God's love. Somebody say discouragement. Then the, the fifth hindrance that we must avoid is pride. Somebody say pride. I need you to understand that a prideful attitude might make someone resistant to letting God's word challenge their preconceived beliefs. Pride can make us resistant to new ideas or revelations of scripture. We may believe we already know everything we need to know and dismiss anything that can challenge our existing belief system. This hinders our ability to learn and grow from God's word. Somebody say pride. A prideful heart can become fixated on its own understanding rather than seeking God's perspective. This makes it difficult to approach the Bible with humility and a teachable spirit. Somebody say, I need a teachable spirit. See, pride can make us dismissive of advice or insights from others, including pastors, teachers, or fellow believers. I need you to understand this is important because this shuts us off from valuable resources that can deepen our understanding of the Bible. Somebody say, avoid pride. Avoid pride. Then the sixth hindrance that we must avoid is spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare, we, 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 we must avoid the hindrance of spiritual warfare. You can't avoid spiritual warfare, but you can avoid the hindrance of spiritual warfare. All right, let me, let me break it down for you. The Bible acknowledges the reality of spiritual forces that will attempt to distract us from connecting with God. Can I just prove it for, for a moment? Even as I prepared for this message I can't tell you how many times my wife walked in and saw me asleep at my desk because of spiritual warfare came in like NyQuil. I couldn't read one sentence without my eyelids feeling like it had 12 pound weights on it until I had to realize I'm under spiritual attack. The enemy doesn't want me to even bring out this word. What you got to realize is that feelings of spiritual attack can lead to discouragement and doubt. We might even begin to question our faith or God's presence, making it difficult to find motivation to engage with Scripture. See, when we feel like we're under spiritual attack, it can be hard to concentrate on reading or studying the Bible. Our minds can become preoccupied with the perceived threats, hindering our ability to focus and receive God's word. The concept of spiritual warfare can be frightening in itself. I don't know about you, but I, I, I don't wake up saying, where's the devil? Come here, devil. Where are you at today? Is there anybody in here that, <laughs> that's not looking for trouble? But if trouble finds me, hey, I'm going to step up. I ain't going to back down, but I'm not looking for it. I wonder if I'm talking to anybody real in here. The concept of spiritual warfare can be frightening. We might fear engaging with the Bible out of a mistaken belief that it will invite further attack. Anybody felt like that? 
that you're afraid to read because you feel like the more I read, the more the devil's going to get mad and try to send hell to your address. But I need you to tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, avoid the hindrance of spiritual warfare. You can't be afraid of what the enemy might do. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Stop forgetting that God will allow you to see it. He said it won't prosper. So the last hindrance in this sermon today, number seven, number seven, this one is what I would like to think is one of the enemy's favorite tools to use. This one is the main attraction, if you will, the main attraction of hindrances that will keep us from connecting to God through his word. That is unbelief. Somebody say unbelief. Doubts about the Bible's validity or God's re relevance can hinder our willingness to engage with scripture. Unbelief can lead to a closed mind and a closed heart, making us resistant to learning and understanding the message of the Bible. If you begin to doubt the Bible's divine inspiration and authority, you'll begin to lose sight of it as a vital source of connection with God. So I need you to understand that unbelief can make it difficult to trust God's promises or teachings found in the Bible, making it impossible to receive God's promises, to receive God's healing, and even miracles. That's why the enemy wants you to engage and embrace unbelief and, 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 and stand in, in alliance and agreeance with the world in saying that this is not true, that this is not factual. He wants you to embrace Embrace unbelief because he knows he knows that if you embrace unbelief, you will cut off your own blessings. If you can embrace unbelief, you will cut off your own promises. You will cut off to yourself from the benefits that God has promised you. Somebody shout unbelief. So Pastor Tim, how do we overcome these hindrances? I'm glad you asked. We must first establish faith in God as our foundation. Faith in God must be our foundation. Faith in God has to be the foundation. Faith in God must be your foundation. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 verse 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder to those who diligently seek him. Therefore, people of God, it is impossible to connect to God without faith. And people of God, you cannot seek God without connecting to his word, which is also essential for overcoming the hindrances uh, to connecting to God through his word. So Pastor Tim, how, how do you connect to God through his word? Y'all got so many great questions this morning. I'm going to help you out. Here's three steps for how to connect to God through his word. And I'm getting ready to take my seat. Three steps for how to connect to God through his word. Number one, read regularly. Read regularly. The Bible says in Psalms 119 verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I need y'all to understand that reading regularly isn't just about acquiring information, but it's about cultivating a deeper relationship with God. God, I feel you right now. I need y'all to understand that daily reading of the scriptures opens our hearts to hear God, to understand his will, and recognize his presence in our lives. Reading regularly. We as the people of God should not take for granted that we have been graced to hear God's voice through his word. 
Tell your neighbor, don't take it for granted. Well, well, why would you say that, Pastor Tim? I need y'all to understand that God speaking to his people is something that even the psalmist marveled at. The psalmist marveled at it. Why? Because God has not spoken this way to any other nation. Well, I need you to understand how special you are. The Bible says, according to Psalms 147, verses 19 through 20, he says, He has revealed his word to Jacob, his laws and decrees to Israel. He has done this for no other nation. They do not know his laws. Praise the Lord. In other words, don't lose sight of the significance that the almighty, holy, and sovereign God loves us enough to give us direction and guidance through his word he allows us to hear his voice through his word he allows us to hear his voice and get direction through his word it is also here people of God where the psalmist describes God's word as light and as a guide for living in verse 130 of this, of this psalm, the psalmist shows us that God's light refers to understanding. So in other words, when we read God's word regularly, we will experience guidance and understanding. Tell that neighbor, say, neighbor, I need guidance and understanding. And tell him that's why I'm going to read regularly. The second step to connecting to God through his word is reflect deeply. Reflect deeply. The Bible says in Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, keep this book of law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it that you will be prosperous and successful i need you to understand that by meditating on god's word we allow it to permeate our being transforming our thoughts our actions and our reactions i need you to understand child of god that deep reflection as encouraged in this verse is a powerful tool for connecting with god through his word the Bible, the Bible is rich with layers of meaning. And I need you to understand that simply reading the words is a good start. But reflection allows us to dive deeper. I can, can I say it to you this way? By pondering the text, by asking questions and considering even different interpretations or translations, we allow God space to give revelation, to uncover hidden truths, and even to personalize the message for our lives. Tell somebody the word of God is living. I need you to consider this, that reading without reflection is like listening to someone speak without truly comprehending their message. We must realize that reflecting deeply allows the word of God to sink in, transforming it from mere information to a source of guidance in our hearts, in our thoughts, and in our actions. I'll say it again because I believe I missed somebody in the back. When you, when, when you reflect deeply on God's word, you allow it to sink in and it will transform it from mere information to a source of guidance in your heart, in your thoughts, and in your actions. See, as we contemplate the scriptures, the Holy Spirit can then convict us of sin. It can illuminate areas for growth and shape our character to reflect Christ. You got to take time to reflect on his word. Tell that neighbor, say, neighbor, take time to reflect deeply. The last step, the last step, and I'm getting ready to sit down, is respond faithfully. Tell that neighbor, say, neighbor, respond faithfully. The Bible says in James chapter 1 verse 22, 
Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. I love the New King James Version. It says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. You got to do the word. True connection with Jesus calls for a life that mirrors his teachings and commands, moving from hearing to doing. God is pushing you from hearing to action. See, when we are faithful to respond to God's word by putting what we learn into practice, it strengthens our connection with God. When we strive to live out God's word, not only will we gain a deeper understanding, but experiencing the principles firsthand will also clarify their significance. All right, I'll prove it to you. Let me prove it to you. See, when we, we, we can read about the power of forgiveness, but being faithful to respond in forgiveness when someone has mistreated you, when someone has stabbed you in the back, when somebody has turned their back on you, when you are faithful to respond in forgiveness, uh, you got to understand that this strengthens our grasp and our understanding of God's grace and its impact on our lives. In other words, it's one thing to read about it, and it's another to live it or experience it. Faithfully responding to the word demonstrates our trust in God and his word. It shows that we believe Jesus' teachings and are not just mere words. We believe that his teachings are not just mere words, but it's principles to live out that will lead to a life fulfilled with purpose. Now, now here is the key to this step, and I don't want y'all to miss it. Here's the, here's the key. I need y'all to lean forward. Here's the key. Uh, here, here's here's the, 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 prince, the promise of it all. This is where transformation takes place. When we are faithful to respond to God's word with action, it becomes the bridge that leads us from intellectual understanding to genuine change. I see I missed some people in the back. As we put God's word into practice, the Holy Spirit works within us, shaping our character and drawing us closer to him. That's why Paul tells us in Romans 12 and 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. The Greek word for renewing in this text is anakinosis, which means the act of reestablishing something in a like new or often improved manner. In other words, it's important to note that this Greek word for renewing is only found right here in Romans 12 and 2 and also in Titus 3 and 5, which says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration, and here it is, and renewing or anakinosis of the Holy Spirit. In other words, he reestablished my improved manner. He reestablished my improved nature. He reestablished my changed nature. In other words, child of God, a mind dedicated to God's truth will produce a life that can stand the test of time. Am I talking to anybody in here? See, we, we can resist. We can resist the temptations of our culture by meditating on God's truth and letting the Holy Spirit guide and shape our thoughts and our behaviors. Uh, now, Pastor has been saying it all last week. He had us saying it. I need you to find one more neighbor because we're going to say it again. Find that neighbor and say, neighbor, watch me transform 
right before your eyes. In other words, let me reintroduce myself. I used to just be a hearer of the word. Let me reintroduce myself. I used to be a doubter. I used to be one that was that was always in fear. Let me reintroduce myself. I used to just be a hearer of the word, but tell that neighbor I'm a doer now. Is there anybody in here that will claim I'm a doer of the word? Can I help you out? There's some benefits for being connected to God through his word. What you have to realize is that you can't be God doing. You can't be God doing. That's why I need you to find another neighbor and say, neighbor, keep doing God's word. Because the more you do, the more God will do more. The more you do, the more God does. The more you practice his word, the more he'll show up. The more you live out the word, the more he'll open doors. The more you do, the more God does. Tell somebody, I got benefits. I'm almost done here. Another benefit to being connected through God's word, you can rest in his love. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11 verse 28, he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I need you to understand that connecting with Jesus through his word brings us to a place of rest. Not only do, will it bring you to a place of understanding, not only will it bring you to a place of revelation, not only will it bring you to a place of deeper connection, but it will bring you to a place of rest. Is there anybody in here that need to rest? Somebody's been troubled in your spirit, trouble trying to figure out how I'm going to make it. I need you just to bring it to Jesus. Jesus, I feel you tugging on my spirit. Somebody been worrying how you going to make ends meet? How you going to rob Peter to pay Paul? You've been trying to figure out how you going to keep your lights on, but I need you just to come to God through his word. Stand on the word that I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor is seed begging for prayer, and let God give you rest. Let him give you rest. In him we find the peace and strength to face life knowing we are loved, we are supported and never alone. So in the text, people of God, we see more benefits to being connected to God through his word. Remember, I told you earlier that in John chapter 15, verse 4 through 7, we see that Jesus uses a powerful metaphor of a vine and branches to explain our connection to God and the importance of staying connected connected to him through faith and his word. We see in verse 4 that Jesus says, remain in me as I also remain in you. He says, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. He says, neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. People of God, we know that Jesus often used parables and metaphors in his lessons to teach us principles of the kingdom of God. In this verse, Jesus draws a vital reference of comparison of himself to the vine. Jesus, Jesus shows us that he is the source of life and nourishment for the branches. Then we see in this verse that he draws us to another reference of comparison that we, the believers, the people of God, we represent the branches. Tell that neighbor, say neighbor, I'm a branch. But Jesus teaches here, he teaches us a vital principle here that connection is key. Tell that neighbor, connection is key. Jesus, like a branch, uh, he said, just like a branch cannot bear fruit on its own, we cannot live a fruitful Christian life or experience spiritual growth without being connected to Jesus. Jesus says in verse 5, he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He says, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. 
fruit. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. We see here that Jesus reiterates the importance of and benefit of remaining connected to him. He shows us that those connected to him will bear much fruit. Is there anybody in here that desires to bear much fruit? It is important to note here that bearing fruit symbolizes living a life that reflects Christ's teachings, which includes spiritual growth and maturity. It reflects good works and making disciples by spreading the message of faith. That's what's represented here in the text by fruit. Jesus also makes it very plain in this verse that those disconnected from him can do nothing. Tell that neighbor, don't get it twisted. You can't do it without him. Don't even try. And that is where, people of God, that, that there can be no spiritual growth. You got to realize there can be absolutely no spiritual growth or maturity outside of Jesus Christ. In verse 6, he says, I'm getting ready to take my seat here. He says in verse 6, if you do not remain in me and you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers he says such branches are picked up thrown into the fire and are burned it is here people of God in the text where Jesus makes it very plain that there are consequences for being disconnected from him uh, those who disconnect from Jesus through lack of faith or abandoning his teachings are compared to branches that wither and are even eventually burned. I need you to understand, child of God, that it is important to note here that this imagery uh, speaks to the state, to a state of spiritual barrenness. Without Jesus, we will experience spiritual barrenness and separation from God. Jesus says in verse 7, here it is, that if you remain in me and my words remain in you, then you can ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. I wonder who I'm preaching to in here. Jesus shows us that there's a benefit to being connected to him through his word. Is there anybody in here that's glad you're connected to God through his word? See, when we remain connected to Jesus and actively engage with his his word, our prayers become more effective. What are you talking about, Pastor Tim? I'll say it again. When we remain connected to Jesus, when we are actively engaged with his word, when we are living out and being doers of the word and not just hearers, not just seat warmers, when we are walking out the word, that is when our prayers become more effective when we immerse ourselves in God's word our desires and priorities our desires and priorities begin to align with his will that's why he can say that if you remain in me and my words remain in you you can ask for whatever you will because if my word is in you you're not going to ask for someone else's husband. If my word is in you, you're not going to ask for somebody else's wife. Ah, who am I talking to in here? When you have his word on the inside, it will change the way you pray. It will change the way you talk. It will change the... Am I preaching to anybody in here? Tell that neighbor, say, neighbor, in you, if you have God's word in you, you can ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. 
I need you to understand, child of God. I'm getting ready to take my seat here. But when his words remain in you, you will learn how to differentiate between selfish wants and genuine needs that glorify him. Am I preaching to anybody in here? When his words remain in you, your prayers will begin to shift from being more about personal gain to the things that ultimately reflect God's will and purpose for your life. Is there anybody in here that because of the word of God that's alive in you, your prayers have shifted from what you want and what you need to God bless my neighbor. God bless this homeless person. God bless my enemies. Is there anybody in here that prayers have shifted because there's something on the inside that every time I want to pray for myself, something changes in me. Something takes control of my mouth. Something takes control of my spirit to where I end up praying for my haters. I wish I was talking to somebody in here that will say I'm grown in God. I'm mature in God because I got his word in me. Jesus says, Jason, I'm ready to go. Jesus says, he gave us a promise here. Is there anybody in here that like promises? Is there anybody in here that's glad you got some benefits? Well, God gave us a promise that if we remain in him and his words remain in us, he says, we can ask for whatever we wish and it will be done for us did you hear what I said when his word remains in you you can ask for what you need you can ask for what you wish and it shall be done for you and that's why I came to tell somebody that I'm glad that I'm connected to God through his word I'm glad that I know Jesus for myself because there is a blessing to being connected to God there's some benefits that I got because I'm connected to Jesus tell that neighbor that's why I'm glad that I'm connected to God's word because I that's why I'm glad that his word is in me. The writer said, thy, thy, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. I got benefits because I'm connected through the word of God. I got benefits. I understand will more and more each day. I got benefits. I understand that I I'm the head and not the tail. I got benefits. I understand that I'm called to be the lender and not the power. I got benefits. I know that according to his word by his stripes you're already healed. I got benefits. Is there anybody in here that will declare? I got benefits that you shall live and not die. I, I, I got benefits. Tell that neighbor I serve a God who owns a cattle upon the hill. I got benefits. Tell that Oh, your needs are 
keep reading. That's why I'll keep reflecting. That's why I'll keep doing the word of God. I'll keep responding faithfully because I got benefits. Is there anybody in here that's glad you got benefits? Tell that neighbor that as long as I keep the word in my heart, in my mouth, I can walk by faith and not by sight as long as I keep the word in me as long. And I will fear no evil, cause that-